Alrighty, alrighty, alrighty. Here we go again. We are moving on into chapter 5 of Revelation. We finished up chapter 4, um, ending the judgment of the saints and the mercy seat. And now we're moving into chapter 5, verse 1. And we're going to move right into a lot of symbolism. And a lot of things concerning this book. Now this book is amazing in itself. It's the only book in the entire Word of God that is yet to be fulfilled that we have. Everything else, whether it be from Genesis all the way to Jude, has already been fulfilled per se. Now there are certain prophecies lining up through the prophets and through the disciples even that are pertaining to this book. But as a whole, as far as a book itself, this is the only book in the entire Bible, of course, as y'all know, that is written to us um, from almost 2,000 years ago for something that's still yet to come, which is very interesting in itself. All right, so we're going to start in chapter 5, verse 1, and I will begin reading, of course, as always. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. All right. The one that's sitting on the throne, who is this? This is the Father. This is the Father. Um, you have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. This is Father God. Okay. It's uh, in the right hand. You know, it's immediately it says, I saw in the right hand. This is John seeing this vision. Now, you got to remember this. This is John. This is the revelation shown to John. So John is seeing everything from here on through to the end of Revelation. You will notice this is one continual thing. This is not something that happened like part on one day and part of another day and part of another day. This was not a succession of dreams that he had. This was one vision that is continued on chapter to chapter to chapter. If you'll notice, it says, and, this is a continuation of chapter 4. If you notice in chapter 6, it says, and, which is a continuation of chapter 5. And anyway, it just goes on and on and on, my point. All right, immediately, I saw in the right hand. Right hand, what does it mean? Sandy and Kimberly, you should know by now. Um, the right hand means power. It means authority. We see in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, Father, a book. Now, this is not a literal book like we have today. Our Bibles are books. This is a scroll. Now, this scroll is probably in length. Maybe, I don't really know. I mean, I don't think it ever gives any dimensions. I would say maybe a foot in length as far as side to side is what I mean. I don't mean like once it's opened up. I'm just talking about side to side or width. Maybe I should say that. A foot in width. Okay. And you notice it says it's written within and on the back side. In other words, it's on both sides of the scroll. There's writing on both sides of the scroll. This scroll is sealed with seven seals. Now I'm going to teach you something that's a little bit of historical significance along with this that just shows God's perfection. The number seven means completion and perfection also. Seven is the divine number of God. Throughout the entire word of God, you'll see seven, you'll see 70, you'll see 700. Different things denoting um, his completion and perfection. Um, but what's interesting about this to me is that during the time that John was given this revelation, Rome, of course, was in power, the sixth world empire. Um, interestingly, six being the number of sin and man, and Jesus came during that time to die for her sins for mankind. But this is interesting that it has seven seals because the Roman Empire never used more than six seals. A six seal document during the time of Jesus was of the utmost importance. This was something that was very, 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 very rarely ever done. This had to be something so important that Caesar, the king, the ruler, whatever you would like to call him, this was something that he would only give out in times of maybe um, extreme precautionary measures during war or something to the effect. It, it carried a heavy weight for it. The reason this scroll has seven instead of six, of course, one more, meaning it's God, you know, perfection and completion, but also showing us that God is able to go above and beyond anything that man can do. No matter how much importance man puts on something, God's importance still exceeds that. In verse 2, he says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? This is what this angel is proclaiming. He's asking this question. 
Okay, he's basically asking, you know, who's worthy to open the scroll by breaking the seals on it? John sees this angel. Now, this angel doesn't have a name. It's, it's never given a name. It could be one of the angels listed in the Bible by name. I don't know that, but it's it's an angel nonetheless. And there's millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of angels. It just goes on and on and on. So, it, any one of them. Okay. Verse three. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. No man could do it. No man could even look on the scroll. The scroll is perfect. It's holy and righteous. This is denoting to us the wickedness of man. This is, is, is showing us how incomplete we are, how unperfect we are compared to him. But something a little bit more to add to this. You notice it says, No man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth. Okay, those are three terms mentioned here. And these three terms can be self-explanatory, you know, but then again, it could trip people up. So I'm just going to go ahead and explain it to you. When it says, no man in heaven, nor in earth, nor neither under the earth, let's look at them backwards. Under the earth means men that have already passed on and have passed on to an eternal damnation. These are people who do not believe, you know, they're lost, lost that died. In other words, those in hell or, or the Bible calls it Sheol which is it got, that gets to a whole deep thing anyway but the point is they're not in heaven okay neither under the earth all right nor in earth that means those of us walking around or walking around in an earthen temple those that are alive on this earth right now okay um, no man in heaven's pretty self-explanatory those that have passed on and went on to heaven all right so even those that have already received a glorified body who are well they're not received a glorified body yet per se but they're glorified because they're there with him they're in spirit they're uh, they're spiritualists there's you know the spirit of the inside man that's walking around him they will receive the glorified bodies soon and very soon with all of us praise God um, but nevertheless we're talking about those with him those here on earth, and those under the earth, those, in other words, those that have died, those that are not reigning with him. All right. Verse 4. And I wept much. John John begins to cry. No one was found worthy. He, he begins to shed tears at this. Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Reading from my notes, nobody is worthy, lost, or saved in and of themselves, but Jesus is worthy whose blood covers us. It's just, again, John, you can imagine, he's, he's overwhelmed with what is going on, what he's seeing, what he's being shown here. This had to be more than his anything that he had ever witnessed. I mean, John walked with Jesus. John was his best friend, as a matter of fact, the Bible talks about, his closest friend, the one that Jesus loved dearly. I think the book of John says that. Um, but here, at the, towards the end of his life, he's become more humble. And he's just, of course, matured so much. I mean, we're talking about like 60 years later, you know, and or longer, you know, and just over time. And this penetrates him so much because he's realizing what is going on, even though he doesn't maybe understand it. That's hard, to, that's hard to comprehend itself because with our minds, our intellect, we like to understand. But in the spirit, we know. The Bible says we will know as we are known. We will be known as we are now, you know, and that type of thing. It's hard to understand. Um, verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. In other words, don't cry, you know. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. In other words, a fellow church member comes up to him, a saint. He tells, tells John not to cry. I'm reading from my notes here as I'm looking down. Uh, for Jesus has prevailed to open the scroll. No matter the situation, the Lord always comes through. This, this is what he's trying to get through to John here. You know, 
I was just I was just talking to Maureen on the phone a minute ago. And she's she's in that place right now. She's been saved for a little over two years, and she's and she's in that place right now where Satan is trying to beat her bad with many different things and that's not what this video is about but the, re the reason I brought that up is because I was telling her keep your eyes on the Lord no matter what it looks like no matter what it sounds like no matter what you hear or think or or even try to reason just keep your eyes on him because the Bible says that he will complete any good work that he has started that might not be the way it's worded verbatim but that's what he's saying in other words the moment we're saved he begins a good work in us and he will complete that good work which that verse in itself right there ought to tell people that, you know, that preach this losing salvation thing that that's impossible. How in the world could how in the world could we walk away from him, yet him complete a good work in someone that's walked away? That doesn't make any sense. Would he complete a good work in somebody that's going to hell? Why would those people in hell have a good work? Alright. Verse six. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth he looks up and in the midst of the throne stands Jesus Jesus is referred to the lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the earth of the world I believe the Bible says Isaiah 53 talks about him that he became he come before them you know, as a sheep, as a lamb sent to the slaughter. You know, he was quiet before them. You know, the, the lamb shows us a tenderness, a love, and a humility that is just, <laughs> I don't even know if I can, I don't even know if there's a word in the vocabulary that people have for it. It just, thinking about it brings tears to my eyes. I don't know if you can tell it or not. But, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. Um, John looks up from his tear-stained eyes only to behold Jesus in the midst of everyone, appearing as he did on the day of his crucifixion. Wow. Seven horns. Seven again, the number of completion. Seven horns. The horn also, it, it, this is interesting, because the horn in the Old Testament is representative of the right hand in the New Testament. It, it shows forth power. It shows forth authority. It shows forth, well, really, I mean, it shows forth dominance, too, because God is everywhere. He's everything. He's, he's just... Uh, he, he's omnipresent, he's omniscient, he's omnipotent. You know, he's all these things that, again, we just don't, we can't figure it out. You know, seven eyes, all knowing, omniscient. You know, the seven spirits of God. You know, seven is mentioned three times. The number three in the Bible means resurrection. It also stands for the Trinity. We got seven, seven, seven here, which is God's perfect number. Later on, we'll be studying about 666, which is an, the imperfect number. 777 is the perfect number. Okay. Wow. Sent forth into all the earth. You can also do a little study in there on uh, Isaiah 53. Sandy Kimberly, whoever's watching this, if you want to. And also, again, in Isaiah chapter 11 on that. Verse 7, interesting. We just got through with three sevens. We're at verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. In other words, Jesus walks up to the Father and receives the scroll from the Father. And when he had taken the book or the scroll, verse 8, the four beasts and four and twenty elders, the church, the persona, fell down before the Lamb, fell down before Jesus. In other words, we fall down before Him at that moment. Having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, or odors, odors, which are the prayers of saints. Wow. Upon receiving the scroll, the beast and the church, the beasts, plural, uh, not the beast, the beasts, 
plural. And the church bows down in reverence to Jesus. We all have harps and golden balls full of incense representing the prayers of the saved. If you go back and you, were, and you look at what happened with David and Saul, and Saul had a spirit of vexation against him, and he was just constantly, he, this man had to be bipolar or something. I mean, one day he was completely fine and so, so happy. I see people like this on Facebook. It's like one day they're on fire for the Lord, and they're just like, Nothing you could say to them. You could spit in their face, slap them, beat them upside the head or whatever, and they'd smile and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for it. And then the very next day, you could say, hallelujah, praise God to them, and they'd be like, don't talk to me. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. Don't say nothing to me. You're wrong. I'm right. I know it all. You know, it, it's that's weird that the Bible says in the book of James, I believe, it says, can a brook bring, bring forth fresh and salty water? You know, a spring? You know, that type of thing. And it's like, I wonder sometimes about people, you know, in their relationship with the Lord, you know, not that I'm trying to judge them or, or you know, I mean, I don't know their heart, of course, but it's just, it's strange to me why people can, like, turn it on and off like that so fast. Um, but again, we, we see us falling down, but what I was getting at was the deal with the heart. When Saul would become really angry and bitter and bothered in his spirit, he would call for David, and David would come in and sit down, and David had a harp. And David would play that harp. And it's interesting because it says, the Bible says that when David would start playing that harp, that the spirit that was on Saul would remove itself from him. You know, Music is amazing in a lot of ways, and praise God, you know, he's given me a little insight into music. I mean, there's so many people that do, and so many have a lot greater understanding of it than I do. And, you know, and I don't claim to boast of me of anything that I know. Yet, at the same time, what he has shown me, it's amazing, because a lot of times, people wouldn't come to a church to hear a minister preach the infallible word of God even with fire and anointing behind it. But yet at the same time, somebody could pop up a tent. And even if the music is praising God, they could just set up a sound system and have a band up there or whatever it might be, or even just playing stereo tracks on a CD. And amazingly, people will come. They'll start flocking in. That music draws. And a lot of times, music calms when it soothes the soul. The Bible says. Music has a way of doing things, and I don't want to get into this long, but I think the reason why is because we find out in Isaiah, but more so in Ezekiel, we find out that Satan himself, Lucifer, was basically the minister of music in heaven. He was the angel that God was most amazed with, if, if that makes any sense. He was his he was his best angel. He was so beautiful. God had put everything into him. I mean, he just, you know, he was absolute. Of course, we know the story. Pride was found in him. He rebelled and he fell. But he was the minister of music. You can read that in Ezekiel. And it's a very interesting story. And I bring that up because I believe today, and excuse me, I got to get me something to drink. I don't have tea tonight, though. I have Dr. Pepper, so... <laughs> this is what I usually drink the most anyway, by the way. I, I, I mean, I like the tea, and I like milk, and I like juice. I like all kinds of things, but I like the Dr. Pepper. But the thing is this. If you, it, Sandy, Kimberly, y'all watching this, if you notice today, music is widespread. It's all over the earth, and people run to concerts, buy CDs, uh, download music, you know, use MP3 players, iPods, just on and on and on and on and on and on and on. All types of music. I mean, anything you can imagine, you know, it's out there. It's for people to have. And I don't know how much y'all know about music, but for those of us that God has given a gift to, it's easy to distinguish what is music from what is not, okay? 
And I'm not even necessarily referring to lyrics. Now, lyrics, you know, is a whole other story because the lyrics, you know, are either edifying and glorifying God, edifying the brethren and glorifying God, or they're just of the world, which is vain. You know, I mean, if you turn on a, whatever, an Ozzy Osbourne CD, you know, no matter what the music sounds like, the words there, you know, are not anything to bring glory to his name, okay? But if you listen to something like the Gaither Vocal Band, Ernie Haas Signature Sound, any of these Christian or even contemporary music, Chris Tomlin, Casting Crowns, whatever it might be, whatever the music might be, though, it's totally different because now we're reverting to the words, okay? Now, I say all that to make a point. Music is one of the things in the church today that doesn't get the respect that it should. Oh, my Lord, I can get to a long thing here, and I'm not. I'm going to stay out of that. I'm not going to touch it, okay? I, I promise. I'm not going to touch what just came on my mind. But it, I, ju I just want to say this. I'm going to leave it alone. So many times we're quick to look for a minister that can preach the Word of God. Just, you know, he's on fire for it. He knows upside down and backwards. He's firm in it, and he just he can present it to you. He can just touch your heart and all, and that's great. So many times we look for a church where the spirit is free to move in and, and you don't feel restricted or bound and, and you know you just enjoy the freedom to be able to worship if you want to lift your hand, shout amen, whatever it might be, go down to the altar while the preacher's preaching, whatever it might be, you know, and that's great. So many times we go to church and we look for, you know, a big choir that can stand up there and sing praises unto the Lord and you can just sit back and you can be like, wow, you know, that that's just amazing and that's all great. But too many times too many times people are not concerned with the music they're not concerned with the musicianship they're not concerned if if the best is given towards that it doesn't matter if that person's playing a wrong chord there in that song it doesn't matter if these people are off key while they're singing and look and I don't mean to turn this into a thing of saying that we got to understand it the way man sees it I'm not talking about that we're because we're not perfect we're going to mess up and I don't mean that God is not listening to our heart because that's what he's after praises unto him from our heart that's what he's after but so many times what happens is we get so caught up in this thing of well the Bible just says make a joyful noise unto the Lord that we don't think that we we should give him the best in that we think that we can just open our mouth and whatever comes out is good for him and that's not true when he says he desires the best, he expects us to study in everything that we do. The Bible says to study, to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, well, if you go back to the Old Testament, look, the Lord never picked out people to play instruments, to sing in the choir, to preach, or anything else in the church. The Lord never picked out anybody that he did not bless with a gift to do it. Okay, these were not people that any fly-by-night Joe or whatever. Uh, and again, like I said, I'm not trying to lift up the thing of, oh, because you got a degree, a doctorate in music, that you're supposed to be the right one. I don't mean it that way. But it just seems to me that Satan has come in just like he has in the world with music and twisted man's perception of what mu music really is. He's also done that to the church. He's allowed the music in the church to just become less and less to the point where it's like, well, hey, as long as you got some musicians and some singers, it doesn't really matter what it sounds like because we're all in here to glorify God anyway. You know, it's a nonchalant attitude, and, and I wonder sometimes, you know, what does God think about that? All right, I'm off that. I'm sorry. I got carried away with it. All right, I, I, as you can tell, music something's close to me and something, I'm not, you know, that I'm into. All right, verse 9. Let's go ahead and read verse 9 and 10. They're connected. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Mm. Verse 9 and verse 10. A new song will be sung praising Christ for what he has done for us and for preparing our home that he has remade. There is a sound of excitement 
in our voices to be able to return to the earth. See, a lot of people will tell you that, you know, that our home is up there. No, 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 no. Our home is where Jesus is, and Jesus for eternity, not now, but for eternity will be here on this earth. As a matter of fact, Jerusalem, if you you know, you, you look over there right now in the Middle East and see all the conflict going on. The reason all the conflict's going on is it's been that way from the beginning. It would always be that way. That was told to us in uh, Exodus, no, or no, Genesis, at the end of Genesis, I believe. It is what it is, and it's going to happen. I mean, you can't stop it. You know, so many times we're talking about, well, if we send this ambassador in, or if we, the president goes over, or his wife goes over, or, or Speaker of the House, or whoever, I don't know all those people's names in those terms. I, don't, I could care less about it. Point is this, man is never going to stop what's going to happen over there. It's only going to keep fluctuating and getting worse and worse and worse until it leads up to the Battle of Armageddon, which we'll read about later in the book of Revelation. That being said, though, our final place is here on this earth, but this earth will be remade then. This earth will become perfect. This whole earth will be like the Garden of Eden was when Adam and Eve were first created and put in there. So that'll, that'll be astounding of itself right there. You know, just, just another blessing that the Lord's going to bestow on us that trust Him and believe in Him. You notice in verse 9 it says that we were redeemed by God by thy blood. You remember I told you it, the blood is the covenant. It's always a covenant. Even from man to man there's a blood covenant. And I don't want to get into all that because that's not anything to do with this. But blood covenants is the way the Lord always seals things. He says, out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Four in the Bible is the number of the world. This covers the whole world right here. Every kindred, every tongue, people, and nation. What does the word tongue here mean? It means how they speak. It means, you know, like someone Chinese right now would be speaking in English. They would be speaking in Chinese. That's their tongue. And I can, I can get into all that, too, in the book of Acts, because so many people misinterpret tongues. I mean, there's different tongues in the Bible and, and all that type of thing. But what he's talking about here is the people, were, you know, everywhere were scattered around. You know, it's people from every place on this earth. Listen to what he says right here in verse 11. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders. Now, all of a sudden, he's hearing all these angels. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. In other words, 100 million plus. Can you imagine that? I have no idea what that would sound like. There's no way. That's impossible for man to ever even hear. I mean, it's just, I don't know. I really don't know. Verse 12. Saying with a loud voice. Now, this is what he's hearing the angels say. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy are you, Jesus. Yes, amen, amen. The Lord's worthy. He's worthy of all. All power, honor, glory, majesty, everything that we can think of, every adjective, anything good. He's worthy. It all goes to him. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. We're back to number seven again. Ain't that amazing? Seven, that number of perfection is back in there. John could only watch and listen and all at the sound of over 100 million angels crying out, Worthy is the Lamb to receive these seven blessings. Wow. That's amazing. Verse 13. All right, now, Kimberly, Sandy, y'all listen up to this. All right, I'm going to try to... Oh, I'm almost... Man, I'm always 30 minutes already? Wow. Okay, well, praise, praise the Lord. We're going to go until the Lord stops. There's, some, there's a debate. There's a debate of whether or not pets will be in heaven. Let's read verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them. I heard them saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever. 
That verse right there, to me, proves that het, that pets, as we talk about pets, that animals will be reigning, just like they were in the Garden of Eden, that they will be reigning with us from now on. Now, whether or not, Kimberly, whether or not Jack's your dog right now, you know, when he dies, if he dies before we're gone, okay, whether or not that particular animal will go on forever and ever and ever, I tend to believe he will. Okay, that's just my own opinion. But I do not have scripture to prove that. This scripture right here, though, clearly proves to us that animals are just as important to God as we are in the sense that he created them and that they show. Look at what it says. John heard them saying, these animals are talking, every animal. I mean, imagine that. Every creature which is in heaven. You remember back up here when we were reading about people. In verse 3, what did it say? No man in heaven, no man uh, in earth, and none under the earth. Now look at what we got here with animals. Every animal which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea. In other words, fish, whales, all these things that dwell inside the ocean. Even all of them. They're going to be shouting glory, and praise, and honor, and all that type of thing. Now, if, if animals, a lot of people argue, well, do animals have souls or do they not? Okay? We are three-part beings until we are saved, and then we become four-part beings because the Holy Spirit comes in, and the Holy Spirit seals our spirit. So we're four-part beings at that point. Okay, we're well, three-part to start off with. Animals are flesh, and animals are soul okay now and the way you can find that you can go about Genesis and find this out I don't, I don't want to get into all that my point is this will the soul when that animal dies cease to exist I don't believe that and I'll tell you why because that that is created spiritual does not die does not cease to exist those that die the second death in the lake of fire at the end of Revelation, which we'll study later on, which is hell as we know, okay, for eternity, eternity, eternity doesn't cease. Eternity just goes on and on and on forever. And that doesn't make any sense in our minds either. But the point is, eternity, for eternity they will be tormented, okay? So even though they died, even though they died a second death, that death does not mean extermination or the end of existence the death means separation from God and eternal devastation that's totally two different things well I completely believe that the souls of animals will go on existing too because a soul is something that is breathed from God into the body all right this is the breath of God the breath of God is as much God as God is God Okay, now some animals will end up in hell and some will end up in heaven. Now, I could prove that too, but I don't want to get into all that either. It's not like they have to be saved to get into heaven, okay, or any of that type of thing. But my point is, like I said, if you want a scripture to talk about animals with people, turn to this verse right here. Talk to them. There's some in Isaiah, there's some in other parts of the Bible too. And usually the other ones are the ones quoted. Like you'll hear the one in Isaiah, the lamb shall lay down with the lion, and that type of thing. Those scriptures are fine, and but those scriptures allude a little bit more to spiritual things than actually the physical. It's, it's more symbolic. This right here, though, is a literal thing going on. This is literally animals, every type of animal you can imagine, including snakes, Sandy and Kimberly, including spiders, Sandy and Kimberly. Every creature that he created is praising him in this moment. Verse 14. <laughs> Let me read what I put on my note right here. This just backs it up. Every type of animal God ever created begins to utter the same sentiment from earth that the angels were from around the throne. It's just, it is, it's echoing. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine right now if we could hear what the angels were singing and saying in heaven and then we could utter it back? 
you know, back and forth. That's the reason he wants us to praise us with with everything. He wants us to praise us with our hands, with our eyes, you know, with our mouth. Every part of us, he desires that it would be for him. All right, verse 14, we're going to finish this chapter up. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that lived forever and ever. In other words, the church falls down and worships him who lives forever and ever. We're going to live forever and ever too. We're going to be worshipping him and praising him and just... It's going to be something else. The four beasts echoed with amen. The term amen literally means let it be so according to your will, Father God. Okay. The church now bows to their creator and worships him forever and ever. All right. So on the next video, we will begin in chapter 6. And now we will begin to start seeing what is going on interestingly six being the number of sin and the number of man we're going to be diverted back to what's going on with man we we just covered the church age and then we've covered chapter four and chapter five dealing with the church reigning with him now we're going to be directed back to what's going on on this earth and we're going to get into some deep deep and deep cotton for quite a while so fasten your seat belts and put on your helmets and get your popcorn and your drinks <laughs> all that type of thing all righty i love y'all both and i'll be getting to uh next video as, as soon as he lets me god bless y'all